Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements for this message. Now here's this week's message. today. <clears throat> if you were to ask the average person, what is the biggest sin for Christians? You know, you'd probably get some different responses, right? If, what's the greatest sin among Christians? Well, they might go to something sexual. They might say, you know, being promiscuous or homosexuality. If you were to ask somebody, they might say abortion. They, you know, with the political climate that we have today, they might say uh, the, the national debt or some kind of uh, uh, government overreach. They, they, they could say all kinds of things, but if you were to ask that question to a thoughtful Christian, they would say, well, the Bible, as you read it, has two sins that come up quite often, and that's idolatry and injustice. Those are the two big ones. In fact, Jesus, when he was asked to kind of summarize, you know, what is the most important, the weightiest thing for God, he cites those two things. He says, notice at the top of your outline. He says there in Matthew 22, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So idolatry is the violation of the first one, of not loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And injustice is the second one, a violation of that, of not loving your, the, your neighbor as yourself. But the number one is idolatry. We're going to be looking at that a little bit today. Idolatry, idolatry, greatest sin. The Bible constantly warns against it. The very last verse of the book of 1 John says, Dear children, keep yourselves from idolatry. And what is that? Is that, I mean... Is that something that they used to just do in the old days, you know, worship little objects made of wood and stone and metal? I mean, come on. We're in the 21st century. We're too sophisticated. We're too advanced to make an idol of something that's metal, like our cars. You know, we're, we're, too, we're too advanced and sophisticated to make an idol of something wood and stone like our houses. Right, that's something for them back in the day. It's like the teacher asks the, her kids, she goes, tell me about some religious objects that are in your homes. And so one little kid, he goes, well, my mom has a picture of a lady with a halo and she's holding a baby and each day she kneels at this picture. Little, another little kid pipes up. He goes, well, in our home, our parents, we have, uh, they have a, uh, a, a brass statue of a guy sitting down, crossing his legs, and every day they light incense to it. Third little kid says, oh, in our home, my mom in her bathroom has a little platform she stands on, and, and every, every day she stands on it, she goes, oh, my God. <laughs> so different types of religious objects. But that's really not the kind of idolatry that the Bible, you know, if you look at the Bible, and there, idolatry can be like that, wood, stone, and uh, metal, those kinds of things, but more than not, it's about something internal. Something happens within us. It's an idolatry of the heart. Here's one place that that's mentioned in Ezekiel. He says, son of man, these people have installed idols in their hearts. They have embraced a wickedness that will ruin them. Why should I even bother with their prayers? God's certainly frustrated with it. He says it's self-destructive. And he talks about idols in our hearts what is an idol? Well, an idol is a substitute for God. Anything that is an alternative for God. 
things that we set our hearts on, things that we set our minds on. We maybe dream about them. Uh, we uh, um, have our imaginations follow them. Gosh, what would it be like if I had only gone to Harvard? What would my life be like if I had only married so-and-so instead of the person I'm with? You know, what would my life be like if I, my kids turned out differently and, and had different gifts and different, different accomplishments? And we just live in this little fantasy world because if these things were true, then I would be happy. If these little things that I dream about, or big things, uh, were, then I would, my life would have more meaning. I would find more peace in my life. And we're, we're looking for things that God wants to give us, but we look for other things. And he says, those are, those are idols. We wouldn't normally talk about it like that, but that's what the Bible says is an idol. That's what Jesus is talking about. When he says, hey, you're supposed to be loving God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, and your soul, but really, you've, got, you've gone, you veered off the road somehow. And you're looking for meaning, you're looking for satisfaction, you're looking for these other things that cannot produce that. And it's interesting, an idol is not necessarily something bad. An idol often is something that's good, but that we make it like ultra important. It's super important for us. It's the ultimate thing in our life. It's not always a bad thing. I mean, sometimes we just think, hey, you know, that person made cocaine their idol. That person, you know, made gambling their idol. They made pornography their idol. But, you know, the truth is that often it's the good things. For example, motherhood is a good thing, certainly. Motherhood is a good thing, but when, for some moms, they can have no peace in their life unless all of their kids are well-adjusted and are happy. If one of them's not doing well, they toss and turn at night. They can't have the peace of Christ in their life. They can't be happy. They say, I can't be happy because one of my kids is not thriving, is not doing well. And so motherhood, which is something that is a good thing, becomes an idol and ends up ruining somebody's life because of, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a good thing that's become the ultimate thing. You know, another example would be a, uh, uh, patriotism. There's, yeah, that's a great thing. Love your country, what they stand for. But when patriotism becomes an idol, then anything that somebody says negative about foreign policy or, or, or the way the government is responding to certain things, you know, in the world, they're the enemy because, because it's become an idol for us. Work is a good thing. That can become an idol. Work is all of a sudden all-consuming because it's become this idol in our life, something that's good that becomes this, the ultimate. The test to know if it's an idol is, see, when it's taken from us, what happens? When, 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 and things get taken from us. We lose things. We lose people. And, when though, and, and if, it's, if it's not an idol, then what happens is, certainly if, if, so, if you lose something that's real important to you, you're going to grieve. But if it's an idol, you fall into despair. You see, in grieving, you can be counseled by friends, you can be encouraged by the church, you can be consoled by God. But when we're in despair, nothing helps. Your life is shattered, it's over. The great reformer Martin Luther said, despair crushes your bones. When I read that this week, I thought, yeah, that's a good description of it. Despair crushes your bones. It's something that's, it's, that's good that you've elevated to a place where now life is no longer worth living. Being in love is a good thing. And if you were to lose that love for some reason through divorce or separation, death, all kinds of reasons we might lose a love, it would be normal to grieve. But if you feel like, well, I might as well just go find a bridge and jump off. See, that's... That's, that's become an idol, which leads me to the next point, which is idols are something you would give anything to. God created us in such a way that we're going to give everything to him. We're going to live our lives for him, our time, money, energy, our focus, our, our, our gifts. Everything is, is in service to the Lord. But an idol will demand that very same thing, a false god. It's a, it's a, it's a counterfeit God, and it says, I want all of that from you. I want all of your money, all of your time. And so if work becomes an idol, then all of a sudden you'll work all the time till 2 in the morning, even if it hurts your health. It doesn't matter if it alienates your kids from you. It doesn't matter if you end up losing your spouse. You can end up just sacrificing your integrity on the idol worship of work. 
because it's all, it'll demand everything from you. And so idols, they suck all of that from us. They, they, they offer something that they cannot produce. And long term is usually where it hurts us. Think of bodybuilders, for example. Bodybuilders, some of them, they, they resort to taking steroids or uh, human growth hormones. And, and, and in the short term, they, they start to look great. They're happy with it. Of course, their hair starts to grow extra long and, and their thin gets thicker. And next thing you know, they can, are susceptible to diseases of jaundice and heart disease and an enlarged heart and uh, sterility, all kinds of things. But, you know, all that, they just say, hey, man, all that matters is I'm ripped. Look at this. Look at what I got going on. See, an idol will demand everything, even if, it's, even if it hurts you, even if it's destructive for you. And that's, that's, uh, that's what idols are. So now that we're all kind of on board, we're going to be looking, we're in this series uh, that families are messy and idols are not just something we struggle with, they struggle with them in those days as well. So we're going to look at Jacob. He's one of the patriarchs. We've been looking at Genesis. If you have your Bibles, open them to Genesis 29. 29. Okay, you can open up a Bible app. You'll want to follow along. We'll be spending a fair amount of time in Genesis 29. And we're going to be specifically looking at Jacob. He was the one, his na- he was renamed later on uh, Israel. And he's the son of Isaac and Rebekah, the grandson of Abraham and Sarah. What were Abraham's idols? Well, Abraham or, or Jacob would do anything for his father's blessing. That was an all-consuming thing for him. So for him, it didn't matter if he had to lie, if he had to cheat, if he had to manipulate, if he had to deceive it. All bets were off. He needed this. It was an idol for him. And so he would do whatever it took to get his father's blessing. His, do- his dad was old. He was blind. And so he tricked him. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm Esau. But he really wasn't. He was Jacob. He noticed there in verse 19 of Genesis 27, Jacob said, or really lied, Jacob lied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat my, of my game that, you may, that, that your soul may bless me. And so God had promised a couple chapters before this that when the twins were born, Esau and Jacob, that the blessing would go to Jacob. But Jacob didn't want to wait for God's timing. He, do, he wasn't in a place where he was trusting God because he had set this, 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 this uh, idol up in his life that he had to have his father's blessing. And so he did whatever it took. He deceived and his brother found out about it, that he had, dece- that he had deceived the father and sold his blessing. And his brother's incensed. He says, I'm going to kill you for doing that. When father dies, you're going to lose your life. Jacob finds out, he flees. He ends up having to travel on foot 400 miles north up to what is now modern day Iraq. He never sees his parents again. All of it he leaves behind, all because he said, I, I want this property because the, the blessing to the firstborn was he got the property and he, and he got control of the family, which he lost those. And, and then he gets this blessing through the ancestry, through his legacy. Now, even though Jacob manipulates and deceives to get this blessing, God is still in the background through his providence. God's providence leads him to his wife, Rachel. To Rachel. So picking up in Genesis 29, verse 1. It says, Then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the eastern, prophet, of the eastern people. There he saw a well in the open country. Verse 4. Jacob asked the shepherds, My brothers, where are you from? We are from Haran, they replied. He said to them, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked them, is he well? Yes, he is, they said. And here comes his daughter Rachel with the sheep. Now this ends up becoming his wife. This, so God's providence is in it. God's providence is his care and his concern. You see, God doesn't just create the universe, create the world we live in and then leave. He's not like hiding on Mars or on the other side of the universe. He's, he didn't like create everything, get it going, and then now it retreats to the safety and security of heaven. No, God's very involved in our life. He's, he's, he, he, he created it and he stays involved. And that's what providence is. God's involved in us. He provides, he protects, and he's interested in, uh, in us. And so here you have this providence going on. But also, not only did God lead him to Rachel, but also there's, he, 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 he led him to some discipline. He leads him to discipline. 
drop down to verse 20. It says, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days did because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is complete and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when the evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is it that you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? So now Jacob has met his match. Here Laban is like the master deceiver, right? I mean, Jacob thought he was good at manipulating this guy, the master manipulator. And he's all upset, right? He's, he's, he's hey, what's going on here? I can't believe you did this to me. Now it's okay when it was Jacob doing it, right? Now he all of a sudden has a conscience. Now there's a right way and a wrong way of doing things. And God's discipline often comes to us by the very things we do to others. This is a common thing. Jacob was deceiving people, getting lying, manipulating people. It comes right back at him. And then he reacts like we would. Hey, I'm upset. You know, look at how this person gossiped against me. Yeah, well, what about when you gossiped? Well, that's different. I have my reasons. <laughs> yeah. But God brings discipline. And so one of the provocative questions that we can ask God in prayer is when the next time we have injustice come our way, next time we have un unfairness come our way, is we ask God, is this, is this part of your discipline in my life? Are you interested in refining me in a way here that I'm not aware of? Because sometimes, you know, we're... we're we have blind spots and we're not even aware of them. We don't realize how offensive some of the stuff we do is to God. And God says, you know what, These, I, I want to change some things. And so this is what he's doing to Jacob. This is what he does in our life. And he whispers to us. The Holy Spirit wants us to become more like Christ. He wants us to grow in Christ. He wants us, the Holy Spirit speaks in us and through us. And we need to listen. We need to say, God, what are you doing here? You know, is this, do you want me to say this? Often the Holy Spirit will say, don't do that. Don't act that way. Don't treat that person that way. And then sometimes we just shine them on, right? I'm doing what I want. And then we're shocked when we get the results we get. It, one of the rules we've had here from, we, Sharon and I started this church 23 years ago, and when we started hiring pastors, uh, we told, I've told them all, and that's our rule today, is I said, listen, if you ever have an affair, you will be fired, you'll lose your job. I just straight up, and I said, but here's the thing, is you're not losing your job because of the affair, it's because the Holy Spirit will be screaming so loud at you, don't do this, and you're, not do and you're totally ignoring the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's a problem, that's a problem, and it is a problem. And so we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. In three weeks, we're going to start a new series right after this one called Hello, Holy Spirit. Six weeks long. We're going to talk about engaging with the Holy Spirit, letting God speak to us in greater ways and speaking through us in deeper ways. And you'll want to be part of that. Hebrews 12 says, My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It is the child he loves that he disciplines and the child he embraces he also corrects. Just because you're saved, because you know the Lord, because you know the Lord loves you, doesn't mean that you're exempt from God's discipline. And so you, you say, God, but he brings it lovingly like a, any good parent would do to bring correction to cause us to um, grow and become more like God wants us to become. So Jacob was willing to do anything for his father's blessing. Jacob would also do anything for romantic love. Jacob experiences love at first sight. He sees Rachel, he's overwhelmed. There in verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had lo a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. So Jacob falls head over heels for, for love at first sight. So I was thinking since last week is the 50th anniversary of the Beatles album, uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. You know, on that album is, this, is the song, A Little Help for My Friends, and it goes like this. Would you believe in love at first sight? Yes, I'm certain that it happens all the time. 
that's not very good. You don't want me on the worship team. But <laughs> it makes the point. It does happen. And you have, you have uh, people, you know, Romeo and Juliet and uh, Anthony and, and, and Cleopatra. You have uh, 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 Queen Guinevere and uh, Sir Lancelot. And for the Bible, you have Jacob and Rachel. This, this, he just is smitten by her right off the bat. And, J and he's willing to do whatever it takes to get her. He pays any price. He worked seven years for her, which is way beyond the, the normal bride price uh, in the ancient world. He's willing to serve her, slave in the hot sun, long hours, seven years. As a side note, ladies, listen, if, if you have a guy in your life who is pushing you to move faster than you're comfortable, wants your affection faster than you, feel than you feel comfortable, he is probably not the guy for you. A guy for you is a guy who will wait for you. So Jacob here, he's, he's, con he's consumed, though, with and inflamed with passion for, uh, for uh, Rachel. It says, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is complete, and I want to make love to her. One Bible scholar says that this phrase in, the, in Hebrew, I want to make love to her, is an unusually graphic sexual phrase in the ancient world. I mean, think about it. Even in the 21st century, if, if, if some guy were to say to his uh, to his father-in-law, hey, give me your daughter. I want to have sex with her. I mean, that still would be a little rough, right? <laughs> What'd you say to me, boy? <laughs> but in our culture, though, sex though, and romance is all the rage. I mean, if you go and, and see the movies, you watch the previews, it's just like you, you think that that's all we're consumed with. And part of the reason is because as God has been pushed to the margins of society, as he's gone to the periphery of people's thoughts, that they're looking for meaning. They're looking for something that transcends this, just this normal world that is, that's filled often with just drudgery. They're looking for something greater. And so they look to sex and romance. They, 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 they look for that to help them feel like life is is, is, is uh, more meaningful. Tim Keller in his book, Counterfeit Gods, quotes Ernest Becker regarding the way secular society tries to find meaning and transcendence in sex. And here's what he says. Becker wrote this. He says, the modern secular person still needed to feel heroic, to know that his life mattered in the scheme of things. He still had to merge himself with some higher, some self-absorbing meaning and trust and gratitude. If he no longer had God, how was he to do this? One of the first ways that occurred to him was the romantic solution to self-glorification that he needed in his inmost nature. He now looked for in the love partner. The love partner becomes the divine ideal within which to fulfill one's life. All spiritual and moral needs now become focused in one individual. In one word, the love object becomes God. After all, what is it? that we want when we elevate the love partner to the position of God. We want redemption, nothing less. And so we're looking for, for something to fill that need. And, and so when we look to that, that God put us in, we have a, a God-created uh, hole or vacuum in us that was meant to, to have God there. And when we push him away, we look for other things. Some people look for art. Some people look for sex and romance. That's, a real, that's, that's all the rage, as I said right now. It's just sex and romance. And, and hopefully that'll, that'll fill my need. You think of the movie Titanic. At the end, Rose says of Jack, she's, with her love affair with him, she says, there was a man named Jack Dawson and he saved me in every way possible a person, a person can be saved. And this is what people are looking for. It saved me from this Life that seems to have no meaning. And we put that on the other person. And we, we, we look for that. And, and so movies, you know, are, used to have more of a redemptive theme. Now they have a romantic theme. More and more, this, the romance, this is, I'll find meaning there. But unfortunately, the problem with that is we always wake up with Leia. It's always a disappointment. It's always like, oh, it's not what I wanted. <laughs> I mean, you know, this, that's what Jacob did is he goes, he woke up, he goes, this isn't what I expected. And that's what happens when we replace God with romance and sex. That's a good thing. But when we replace God with it, two major problems 
occur. And one is, is that it just can't meet that, need, that deep need in you that you, you and I have. That deep need of, hey, I, I, I wanted something more than this. Second reason is, is it's, it, it, nobody can live up to that. It actually hurts the relationship. I know of a number of, 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 I've counseled many, many people over the years. Had good, they were good people and really were compatible, had a lot of things, but they made each other their idol or one made the other an idol. Said, oh, in you, I, I expect you to meet those deep needs of my emotional, my spiritual needs. But nobody can be always there, always available, always caring, always sensitive, always open, always as time. I mean, nobody can meet that need that God was meant to, 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 to meet in our lives. And so we start to think of that person as defective. Oh, you got problems. I have all these emotional needs and you're not there for me. You, it's your problem, you know, you, you have issues, right? And, and, and then it starts to just collapse in itself because we made the relationship of re romance and sex an idol in our life. It became self-destructive and it hurts us. So we, that's Jacob. Now looking at uh, idol, uh, the idols that Leah had. F number one is that she would do anything to beat out her sister. Anything to beat out her sister. Genesis 29 verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. You know, it's, Leah means cow. I'm not sure why you would name your daughter cow, but they were creative, I guess, you know. And uh, Rachel's really uh, just a slightly better. It means, it means you are, a, you know, female lamb. I still think I'd rather have, you know, sheep than, than cow. And so you have this rivalry, though. You read about it, as you read this passage, you realize these people, uh, these two sisters, they had a, a rivalry going on the whole time. And Rachel, she is pretty. She is an attractive figure. She's got it all going on. And here it says that Leah had weak eyes. And one Bible scholar said that he thinks maybe it wasn't just a vision problem. She might have had cross eyes. But certainly she had some kind of vision defect. And she can't meet up. She's, no matter what she does, she's always second to Rachel. Rachel's got it all. Rachel's got the looks. Rachel has all of this stuff going on. And she always comes in second. And that's including her husband's affections. She doesn't have that either. Notice this next verse. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said to, his, uh, to Laban, her father, I'll work for you seven years in return for your daughter, Rachel. So, here, he's willing to do all of this for Rachel, and then, you know, there's that little thing that Laban does to trick Jacob. She ends up in the tent. She ends up waking up next to Jacob. She likes Jacob. She loves Jacob, but Jacob doesn't feel that way. And a lot of times we think of Jacob's viewpoint. You know, can you imagine waking up and, hey, there's Leah. How about being Leah's viewpoint? Waking up and your husband says, oh, it's you. <laughs> I don't want you. I wanted your sister. It's just more pain. She's lived with this her whole life. She's always coming in second, always a rival. And sibling rivalries, huge. Now, we have rivalries in our country. We have rivalries in business. Coke versus Pepsi, right? Lyft versus Uber. Microsoft versus Apple. We have it in sports, right? We have... Um, uh, all kinds of, I have Mayweather and Pacquiao, you have Duke and North Carolina, and then it's in the colleges, you have Army versus Navy, African American colleges, Howard versus Morehouse and Spielman. Lots of rivalries, but the number one rivalry is always sibling rivalry. There's no rivalry like that. It's like the priest who, the, the devil was trying to tempt him to sin, and so he tries jealousy, and he, it doesn't work. He tries, he tries lust, it doesn't work. He tries uh, uh, greed, it doesn't work. So he goes, oh, I've got an idea. He says, your brother just became bishop, and that worked. Sibling rivalries. You know, and it just goes back, and those, this is what she struggled with, a rival. How do you know that a rivalry has turned into an unhealthy idol level? Well, what happens is when it, when it becomes an idol in our life is we start to, 
do negative self-talk. Say, you know what, I, my gifting's not very good. You know, I, I, and, and, we, and we remind ourselves all the time of our limitations. And then we start to feel that God made a mistake in how he made us and what we look like. Friend, if you want to break an unhealthy rivalry, and it might not just be with siblings. It could be, it could be somebody else. It could be uh, your ex-spouse's uh, uh, husband or wife and then their affection with their stepkids. It could be somebody at work who dresses nice or has more items and things and they get and there's they've got a sharper wit and and more people seem to like them and, and we just get into this rivalry thing that's unhealthy the way to break that is to, to genuinely and truly thank god for the way he made you say god you didn't make a mistake thank you for the way you made me my gifts my looks my role in the family, even my limitations. And when you can do that and really believe it and let God talk to you about his love for you and his care for you, all of a sudden that rivalry, that unhealthy rivalry will start to dissipate and you'll get healthy. So Leah, one of her idols, anything to beat out her sister. Another thing, she'd do anything to obtain her husband's love. Now the Bible says the Lord saw Leah. Notice it says there in verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Now, when the Bible says that God sees somebody, what it means is, is that God gives particular concern towards that person because often they're in a place of pain or maybe they have been abandoned. Maybe they're, they're in a place where they, their heart was, was, was wounded or troubled. And it says, God, God says, when he says, I see that, it means he cares about that. He moves towards you in compassion and, and in blessing. This is what he does with, with, with Leah. Not only does he see her, but then he blesses her, and he blesses her with children. Seemingly, he seems to hold off on, uh, on, uh, on Rachel, but blesses her. And two of her kids are the two most important tribes in Israel. One is One of Leah's kids is, is Levi. Levi is the ancestor of all the priests and all the temple priests. Very important. And then also Judah. Judah becomes the ancestor of King David and then ultimately Messiah Jesus. So this enormous blessing, but unfortunately for Leah, she's consumed with her idolatry. It's all about, I've got to have my husband's affections. And because it's at an unhealthy idolatry level, you know, a level of idolatry, she can't she can't receive the blessing that God's giving her like, he, like, like, like she needs to. Notice this, beginning in verse 32. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. That's true. Surely, though, notice where she goes with this. Surely my husband will love me now. She can't appreciate what's happening. It's all about, I've got to have this. It's an idol for her. And then verse 33, she conceived again. And when she gave birth to her, a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. See, the central concern for Leah's life is all about I have to get my husband's attention. And because it was an idol, it was never satisfied by just having, even though God's blessing her, she's having these children wasn't enough. But something breaks with her in this fourth one. Finally, she has another son, and somehow God's love breaks through into her life. Notice, it says, she conceived again. This is the verse 35. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Nothing's mentioned about her husband in this last verse. See, so, somehow she just, you know, okay, that's, that's not the way to live my life. I'm not going to live where something else is all-consuming, pushes God to the margins, trying to give my life meaning in other ways that only God was meant to give. And then she's able to receive that blessing. All of a sudden she goes, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise the Lord. And you know, it's interesting, in Genesis 49, we're told that she finally does win the, the love and the praise of her husband. Now, she's not the only one who struggled with 
an, an idol. Also, her sister did. Rachel had an idol. Rachel would do anything to obtain a child. Now, Aunt Rachel seemed to have everything. She was, had a beautiful face. She had uh, an attractive figure. She had an, a husband who adored her. She seemed to have everything. She would be on the cover of a magazine. She would walk down the red carpet with her husband on her hand. She had the perfect teeth, the perfect hair. She had it all going on, but something was still missing for her. It says there in Genesis 30, verse 1, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. So there's something missing in her. And there's always something missing. There's always, a, there's always Rachel's where they, no matter what you have, you can have it all. The great job, everything. But behind the suburban front door, behind there's always something missing. And Rachel has symptom number one. She goes, if I can't have this, I might as well be dead. She has everything. Everything, Leah looks at it and goes, I'm, you got it all. And here it means nothing to her because she has an idol. It's all about, I have to have this one thing or there's no reason to even live. My life has no meaning. Tim Keller, again, out of his book, Confederate Gods, said this. A, excuse me, counterfeit, not confederate. That's not the right word at all, right? He says, a counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. It can be family and children or career and making money, or achievement and critical, critical acclaim, or saving face and social standing. It can be romantic relationship, peer approval, competence and skill, secure and comfortable circumstances, beauty or your brains, a great political or social cause, your morality or virtue, or even success in Christian ministry. You see, when we get this off balance, when God gets pushed over to the side and we start elevating other things, even good things, we try to find meaning in there that is not meant to be found in there. And it's only a matter of time until we get disappointed because we all are getting older. And as you get older, as you're young, you start, you can collect stuff, right? You can do this, you can do this, you can get this. As you get older, you start losing stuff. You start losing your health. You might lose your job. You lose maybe a loved one. You might even lose a child. And God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's, when we have our mind and our heart set right, when we do what Jesus said, love God above everything else. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul. That's when we get it right. That's when we're not susceptible as much to idolatry because we are saying, God is my sufficient. He is my, he, he meets my needs. And then everything else falls into perspective. So let's, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Well, Lord, we just come to you right now and just take a moment here to pray about what you call idols of the heart. They're not something necessarily sitting on a shelf at home, something we carry with us. It's more dangerous. Certainly frustrates you and is self-destructive for us. And so today, Lord, I would pray that you would give us the grace to walk into a place where we say, even good things should never become ultimate things for us. God wants to spare you from falling into despair that only crushes your bones. to spare you from putting on relationships, expectations that nobody can meet and that actually those expectations hurt that relationship, could destroy it. God, give us the grace to be able to, when things don't go our way, when we have injustice come our way or something that's unfair or hurtful, give us the grace, God, to not just get upset, but to courageously pray, is this your hand of discipline in my life? God disciplines those he loves. 
He certainly loves you. Let's pray. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name, Lord. Help us, Lord, to not be deceived and to think we're free from idolatry. Help us, Lord, to put you first, to trust in you with all of our heart, to not lean to our own understanding and acknowledge you in all our ways. If you've never put your faith in Christ, that is the starting point. Today is your day to do that, where you say, just right now, where you're at in your mind, it's not about joining vineyard or something. This is about you getting right with God, getting your life right. And you say, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me, to pay for the things I've done wrong, the sins of the world, and my sins in particular. Would you, and then invite the Holy Spirit into your life because he's the one who will sanctify you. He'll cleanse you. He'll, he also empowers you. So you say, Holy Spirit, I invite you into my life. Guide me. Refine me. Make me into the person you want me to be. Would you say, God, Forgive me for places where I have put people or things and I elevated them in places they had no business being. Today, with your help, by your grace, I'll put you in first place only. Good things stay good. They don't become the ultimate things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.